Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Susanna Doyle, and I'm the Alumni Relations Manager at Trinity Development and Alumni. You're all very welcome to this week's Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar. We are absolutely delighted to welcome Professors Kingston Mills, Aideen Long, and uh, Luke O'Neill, who will be talking about the Trinity COVID-19 Immunology Project. And we also have Professor Veronica Campbell with us as well, who will be facilitating the discussion and the Q&A. If you are watching on Zoom, you can enter exit full screen mode on the top right of your screen. You can adjust your audio settings on the bottom left of your screen. If you need to leave the webinar, you can do that by clicking on the button on the bottom right of your screen. And if you'd like to ask any questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to do that. You can ask questions throughout the webinar and our speakers will do their best to get to those questions. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you can mute and unmute your video. And again, if you'd like to ask any questions, uh, use the comments button there, uh, that would be great. Uh, we will uh, be uh, speaking for about 35 to 40 minutes. The presentation will be going on along with the Q&A. Um, we do hope to finish up at about two o'clock today. The webinar today is being recorded. If you are watching on Zoom, you'll get an automatic recording shortly. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can go to the TCD Alumni YouTube uh, channel. So now I'd like to uh, introduce Professor Veronica Campbell, and then she will uh, introduce all of our other speakers. Veronica was appointed as the university's bursar and di director of strategic innovation in 2015. This role entails providing strategic leadership in the overall development of the campus to ensure alignment to the strategic obje objectives of the university. Veronica is a member of the executive officers group, the university's senior management team. She is an ex officio member of the finance and investment board committees and chairs the space allocation and capital projects subcommittees of the executive officers group. So now let me hand over to Veronica. Thank you so much for the introduction, Susanna. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to host today's webinar, and I'd like to start by introducing our three panel members. So I'm joined today with, uh, by Kingston Mills, Professor of Experimental Immunology and Director of Trinity's Biomedical Sciences Institute. Also with us is Aideen Long, Professor in Molecular Medicine and Director of the Trinity Translational Medicine Institute and also Luke O'Neill, Professor of Biochemistry here in Trinity College and Fellow of the Royal Society. I'd also like to welcome everyone who's joining us in the webinar today and I look forward to receiving your questions and putting them to our distinguished panel. So the Trinity um, COVID-19 Immunology Project is an absolutely exceptional response by the three of you to this uh, current COVID pandemic. So, Kingston, can you explain how this project and the AIB um, Research Laboratories Hub came about and specifically the research that you're going to be leading out within it? Okay. Um, I've, I've shared my screen, so um, I'm going to give a short presentation to um, um, describe the project. But first of all, let me welcome everybody to the webinar. And just to say, I'm a graduate myself of, of Trinity, I have to say 1976 biochemistry. So I don't know if there are any of you out there from biochemistry and also a PhD in immunology from 1981. So God knows, nearly 40 years ago, but I'm still there. I came back in um, 2002 um, to the, what was then the biochemistry department became the, then became the School of Biochemistry and Immunology. So I'm now currently the director of the new institute in Trinity, um, the Trinity Biomedical Sciences Institute. And um, if I can figure out how to move my slides forward. Um, yeah, okay, so the Trinity Biomedical Sciences Institute, those of you who haven't been on the campus for, for some time will know that this is not on the actual campus, it's off the campus on Pierce Street. And, this was a 90 million euro building that was funded mostly by government funds. Um, in 2011, it was completed and opened, and it comprises all of the School of Biochemistry and Immunology, parts of medicine, bioengineering, chemistry, pharmacy. And uh, there were about 70 research groups in total in the Institute, around 400 researchers, and nearly all medical school undergraduate teaching takes place in this building. So it is a phenomenally 
active research-wise and um, a real hub of activity in Trinity in terms of, especially immunology. Um, we raise a lot of money for research um, work, around 110 million in the last five years. Um, seven spin-out companies have come out of this um, um, building or this institute, um, and they've raised about 100 million in funding. The focus of the, the main focus of research activities are in three thematic areas, biomechanical engineering, immunology, and cancer with a focus um, on immunology within the cancer um, um, theme. Um, so the, moving now to the, um, the COVID immunology project, this really was some, a rapid response to what was emerging in, in around March of this year, we had our first cases of, of COVID-19 in Ireland. And it was clear that Ireland had to have its own plans in terms of dealing with the pandemic, but also as researchers, we felt that we had a responsibility to society um, to do something to help, especially the immunologists, because this is a disease where immunology is going to provide a lot of the solutions. We were very lucky to get a 2.4 million donation from Ad Irish Bank to the Trinity Foundation. And this was really kickstart the project. And um, we also have in review a large grant that we're hoping to get through uh, funding from government through Science Foundation Ireland. We're waiting to hear the outcome of that. The project will be co-led by uh, myself and Aideen Long, and there are 16 co-PIs, including Luke, who's going to talk next. A significant number of international collaborators. We're not working in a vacuum. We're working very closely with institutes like MIT, Harvard, institutes in the UK, Hong Kong, in the Netherlands, and other universities in Ireland, including the Virus Reference Lab in UCD. So why Trinity? Why um, is this the, um, why is it um, relevant to, to more to, do, to Trinity than, than other institutes? Well, we have a particular strong cohort of um, immunologists in Ireland, and in particularly in the, in, the, in, in, in the two institutes that are collaborating here, um, Trinity Biomedical Sciences Institute and Trinity Translation and Medicines Institute. So the TPSI is on the campus and TTMI that Aideen is going to talk about is on the St. James Society. And there they have more translational research and obviously the clinical groups, um, the clinicians working on infectious diseases. So um, to go to uh, the next slide, if I can figure it out. Yeah, so this is really on one slide, um, a lot of work that we're, we're, we're just started right now. And there are four sort of um, major areas that we're tackling. The biggest issue that faces a lot of countries um, with this pandemic, and it's sort of been solved to a certain extent, but still a lot of work to be done in terms of testing. So you probably know that you can detect the virus by an assay called a PCR assay. These are quite laborious assays and we're working on with the group in James's a very quicker assay that doesn't require as much equipment as the current assay. We're also going to be helping with um, developing antibody assays. So when someone gets infected with the virus, they develop an antibody response. And this is a very good way of telling who has been previously infected. And that will help to tell us how many people in the community are infected and how many people are immune, hopefully. We don't know for certain that antibodies will protect, but it's very likely they will. And then that those people, if they've been infected, recovered, are safer to go back to work than someone who hasn't been infected. So that's, that's very important work, um, uh, information that the workforce needs to have in the, in the, in the immediate future. And then we, we get into the, the, the sort of the meat of the project, really, which is around looking at the immune response, the immunology of this disease, because it is very much an immunology based disease, even though it's caused by a virus. What happens during the viral infection is that there's a lot of inflammation, especially in the severe patients, the patients that get very severe disease, and that inflammation spreads from the lungs systemically, and, and even heart problems can be a consequence of this severe inflammation. So one way of treating the patients is to use anti-inflammatory drugs, of course, of which are based around immunology. And what we will be doing is looking at, this work has already started, looking at patients with COVID-19 and healthcare workers who've been exposed to the virus and maybe don't have symptoms. And these are the interesting ones really, because if we look at the ones that have resisted the infection, we may get some clues as to what the important immunological parameters are for controlling the infection. That helps, helps us with vaccine design. And that's the second, our third aspect of the project is helping with vaccine design. Now, we're not going to develop our own vaccines because 
uh, pharmaceutical companies are doing that, but we're feeding into what the pharmaceutical companies are doing by providing expertise that is pretty novel to our our group here in Trinity. So it's helping with, in particular, how to make better memory responses with vaccines and looking at vaccines that can be given by the nasal route, which is a, a better way of getting local immunity in the respiratory tract. And the last area is around um, developing of novel therapies to block the inflammation. And Luke will talk a bit about this. So the inflammation that, that, that causes the lethality in, in, in some individuals. And so if we can quell this inflammation, we have a good chance of preventing deaths from, from COVID-19. So that's the, the sort of um, project in, in a single slide. And I think it's very exciting that we're you know, going to be able to um, contribute to the, not only what's happening in Ireland, but internationally. And that's the important point to our collaborations with large international groups. So at that stage, I'm going to now pass you on to, to Aideen, who's going to talk about the uh, project at the TTMI level. Thank you, Kingston. So I will sh now share my slides. Share. Okay, so my area of research is in T cells, and these are white blood cells that are important in viral infections. So they're important regulators of the immune response. They help B cells to uh, make antibodies, for example, they kill virally infected cells. So they're important players in the body's immune response to COVID-19. As Kingston says, I'm also the director of the Trinity Translational Medicine Institute. And just to give you an idea of what we mean by the term translational medicine, it's an area of biomedical science and it has been described as being um, supported by three pillars. Um, the bench side, which is the laboratory end of the investigations, the bedside, which is the patient, if you like, and community, which I suppose comprise um, clinicians, scientists, allied health professionals, biostatisticians, so basically a multidisciplinary team that work with many technologies. And the, the end goal is to deliver enhancements in disease prevention, diagnosis and therapies. So it's very much patient orientated or patient centered research. And that is the basis of the formation of the newest research institute in Trinity, which is the Trinity Translational Medicine Institute. And by virtue of the fact that it is a translational medicines institute, it's located on the St. James's Hospital site. It is a very large uh, state of the art building that has been, um, sorry, it has been purpose built, very well equipped. In fact, it's probably unique in Ireland in terms of its scale as a translational research institute on a hospital site. It is, while it is on the hospital site, it is um, also got affiliations across other sites. So we have researchers from the Coombe, Women's and Children's Hospital, from the Ch Children's Research Centre in Crumlin. And of course, the natural, National Children's Hospital is being built on the St. James's site. Also on the St. James's site, we have the clinical research facility, which feeds into the TTMI. And importantly, MISA, which is the Mercer's Institute for Successful Aging. And of course, given that that the um, COVID-19 is a disease that affects older people. This is particularly important. We also have researchers from Tala University Hospital. And given that we have um, multiple hospitals involved, we have multiple research themes, just like the TBSI. These include cancer, nanomedicine, genomics, People from genomics are very much involved in this project and of course infection and immunity. We have approximately 40 principal investigators and at least 150 researchers that are working across all of the partners that form 
the uh, Trinity Translational Medicine Institute. Like the TBSI, TTMI is very well equipped with progressive technologies that enable our research. And I really just wanted to point out a couple of these to you because they're very important in the context of this uh, joint immunology project. We are really um, well equipped with state-of-the-art sequencing technologies. And allied with this, we have a very nice piece of equipment which we call the Rhapsody. And this is a machine that enables us to isolate single blood cells or single immune cells from patients and we're able to sequence profiles of these immune cells, single immune cells and particularly profile um, immune genes and immune genes that might be affected by this virus, this COVID-19 disease. So by being able to do that, we hoping that we will be able to predict based on differences in immune profiles of these genes in immune cells of COVID-19 patients, predict who will respond to therapies, who may go on to uh, develop severe disease, or what ther therapies we might be able even to use to treat the disease. So these are very powerful technologies that we can use in um, actually researching and finding uh, solutions to this COVID-19 disease. But as I've said, because we're located on a hospital campus and we have researchers across all the hospital related uh, institutions, our focus is very much centered on the patient. And over the last number of weeks, we have actually been collecting blood samples from COVID-19 patients. And of course, we've been doing that using very much ethical and you know, consent and GDPR guidelines. So we are able to isolate from these blood samples, immune cells and serum, which is the liquid part of blood from these patients. And we're going to be able to ask lots of questions using this, what we call a biobank or a bioresource of COVID-19 patients. So we'd be able to ask questions about the immune basis of the disease. Why do people go on, some people go on to develop severe disease? Using the technologies that I've just talked about, we're going to be able to discover novel uh, biomarkers and predictors of severity and disease outcome. And we're going to be able, I hope, to identify novel pathways, which we will be able to target in a therapeutic way. But this is also a very, very rich resource in terms of um, being able to drill down into the disease, to ask questions like, why is this disease so age dependent? Why is it that children rarely get the disease or rarely appear to have the disease, whereas older people are very much affected by the disease? Why do males have more mortality and more severe disease than females? Why, for example, uh, do obese people suffer very severely? And we have, for example, real expertise in obesity in researchers such as Lydia Lynch down in the TBSI studying this disease. Why do smokers or what effect do smokers, um, how do they respond to the disease? It's becoming apparent that socioeconomic status is an, a, a risk factor for the disease. We also have many clinicians that have cohorts of patients that are going to be very interesting to study the un effect of underlying illness on COVID-19 severity, but actually also understanding these diseases help us to understand and how patients respond to COVID-19 help us to understand more about mechanisms of the, this disease. And we have patients, for example, with diabetes, we have cohorts of patients with autoimmunity. Our clinical immunologist has a cohort of patients that have immunodeficiency, lung disease, etc. We can also ask the question, how do people who are on immunosuppressive therapy respond to COVID-19? So a lot of our research on this joint project will involve scientists, clinicians, people of multiple disciplines to 
uh, ask the question around the COVID-19 patient. So now I'm going to hand you over to Luke, who will tell you more about COVID-19 and the global um, picture of, of COVID-19. Great, thanks Aidy. Thanks very much indeed. Very happy to take part in this webinar, of course. I hope all the alumni are tuning in and it's great to have your participation in so many ways. And just to reiterate Kingston's comment, a big thanks to AIB, of course, for giving us that very generous donation. And I'm lucky in one way, my lab is reopened and many labs are still closed as you probably would, would know. And the reason is we're opening labs now that work on COVID-19. And three weeks ago, my lab gradually came back in. Uh, we're following all kinds of new rules, by the way, as you'll all be aware in the workplace has changed. Social distancing, masks, all kinds. I have an app on my phone that can contact trace, for instance. So many things have changed. But luckily, we can do experiments, which is the main thing. And I'm going to give you, we thought we'd end this three talks with a, one example of some research that we're doing. And my lab is actually very active at the moment against uh, SARS-CoV-2. But just to, to kick off, as you all know, I guess by now, You've never seen the like of this as a biomedical problem. The word frenzy doesn't capture it. I looked this morning, there are 1,200 clinical trials running in the world at the moment as ways to handle this virus. There's at least 110 vaccines in development. The, the global effort is absolutely intense, for obviously for good reasons. And the good news is Trinity are very much a part of this. And as Kingston said, we've got such expertise in this university in immunology, in inflammation, the clinical side in James's. We've got a great cohort of investigators. And, and I want to thank Kingston and Aidan, actually, that they put together this uh, proposal to SFI to link us all together in this way. We have been collaborating for years, of course, but if ever there was a time when 20 heads are better than one, it's COVID-19. Now, the next slide, Ali, if you don't mind bringing it up, I'll give, give you a, a little bit about what the virus is, in case you've forgotten. Yeah, so just to, I need to remind you, but the fact of the matter is, this is the most dangerous thing in, in 100 years to afflict us on Earth. Look at the numbers here. One third of the world's population is in quarantine. 1.2 billion children are kept out of school. I, I read yesterday, 66 trillion has wiped off the world economy. I mean, would you imagine this at happening? And look what's causing it. That, that little purple blob is the virus that causes uh, COVID-19. And, you know, 50 million of those fit on the end of a sentence, of, uh, you know, a little full stop at the end of a sentence. How can a tiny thing like that wreak such mayhem? And of course, we know an awful lot about it. What's staggering as well is the past three months. And it, remember, it only got reported at the end of December. Our knowledge about this virus is now huge, thankfully. Still many unanswered questions, but we are beginning to understand lots about it. And of course, that gives us hope that we will beat it. And by the way, we will beat this virus, there's no question. And as I say, the good news is we in Trinity are, are, are taking part in this great adventure. Now, the next slide, I'll have a bit more information for you. So clearly, um, as Kingston said, this is all about the immune system because the immune system goes out of control. And the immune system senses this virus. This is what it looks like as a cartoon. Little bags of fat. The bags of fat have got little proteins around the outside called the spike protein. That's the key that opens up the cells that this virus infects. Inside the cell, then you have RNA as its recipe. So we know a lot about the biochemistry of this. A great phrase there, Peter Medawar is a very famous immunologist. He called viruses a piece of bad news wrapped up in a protein. And that's what these things are. Next slide, Addy. Now, of course, given that we know what the virus is uh, and the structure of it and what it might be like, of course, we come up with ways to treat this disease. And here are the four main things that are being tested. Vaccines, of course, are number one. And Kingston is a world expert on vaccine development. Kingston is collaborating with companies like Moderna, who are at the forefront of vaccine development. Uh, Ed Lavelle in Trinity is a big excellent adjuvants, which vaccines need. So we've got a big interest in, in the vaccine technologies. Antibodies are the second approach, and they can be used as therapies, and I'll come back to that towards the end. Uh, drugs to kill the virus, they're the antivirals. That's our third strategy. And then the fourth then are anti-inflammatories, and that's what I work on. Because obviously, as I mentioned, this is a disease that causes systemic inflammation in your body once the virus goes out of control. As Aideen said, if you're over 65, older people, they get a really bad inflammatory reaction. Um, I believe the numbers at the moment are 80% of people who've died are over 65. So this is effectively a disease of older age. If we work on inflammation, this is the disease to work on now. Because if we can stop this damage to the lungs, which are the main tissue that gets affected, we can stop all the symptoms of this disease. Now remember, uh, this isn't just the lungs. The virus can go elsewhere in the body. It can affect the heart. It can affect the kidneys. It can even affect the brain. This is an especially nasty virus. But the one thing it does to cause all this injury is to provoke a massive inflammatory response. Now, the next slide. 
gives you a word I'm sure you're all familiar with by now. Uh, a big thrill for us is uh, everybody in the world now seems to be an immunologist or an expert, which can be dangerous. But the fact is, I presume you've all heard the word cytokine by now. Me and Kingston and Aideen have worked on cytokines for 35 years. Uh, it's been bread and butter to immunology for so long. And this cytokine storm, it's the body making too many cytokines from macrophages and lymphocytes. They're the two main cell types that we're most concerned with. That's, that's the thing that's causing all the damage. And much of the effort then is to try and limit this cytokine storm or stop the cytokine storm in the first place. And things like antibodies, antivirals and vaccines stop this getting going in the first place. Now the next slide, a bit more complexity for you. Uh, one solution, as you may have heard of, might be the BCG vaccine. And my lab have been working on this for a number of years. It wouldn't be a main focus for us. We've had collaborations with a guy called Mihai Nitea, who's in Holland. And that reflects the international scope of what we're doing. We are plugged into the best labs in the world, addressing all these key issues. And the BCG vaccine is one option. This is a piece I just wrote recently for Nature Reviews Immunology. But the BCG vaccine has been shown to do amazingly is, it brings up kind of a, a, a non-specific innate barrier, we call this. And in that little box there, you'll see cytokines IL-1 and TNF. They put this barrier up and it's been shown to protect against other viruses that affect the lungs. So respiratory syncytial virus, influenza, the BCG vaccine protects. And this is very strange. This is a vaccine for TB. And yet it does put up this sort of non-specific, if you like, general barrier, this armor that other things can bounce off and not infect us. And the big question there you'll see there is SARS-CoV-2. Seven trials running at the moment with the BCG vaccine. The bottom panel is, we see this as a bridge to a real vaccine. So you might imagine a new pathogen comes along. Now remember, there may, I hate to worry people, there could be SARS-CoV-3. I mean, we predict more pandemics. And of course our center will be very much active for COVID-19, but will be very useful for the future as well. But you can imagine now a new virus comes along, give someone BCG and that will protect until the vaccine arrives. And that's what this idea is. It's a bridge to the real vaccine. We all think a vaccine is at least a year away. Uh, there's a risk there'll be no vaccine, remember, and we've got to be upfront about that. We're optimistic, but you've got to have other approaches just in case the vaccine doesn't arrive. Now, the next slide then gives you a bit more detail on some of the things that we're working on. And again, there is complexity here and nobody should ever think this is a simple battle that we're in here. We need to bring everything we have to bear to fight this. These are the shots on goal. Now the top left-hand corner, can you stop the virus entering cells? We know the virus, the spike protein is a key into a lock. The lock is called ACE2. That lock is found in the lungs. So the virus now enters your lungs. It's also found in the heart. The heart has ACE2 as well. So we know the virus goes in there. You could block that. There's one option. My lab is now measuring ACE2 and we're trying to come up with ways to stop it. Once the virus is in, it replicates. There's drugs to block the replication. Remdesivir is the big hope there. That gave a report last Friday. They got a 30% response in the trial in early stage patients. It didn't work in, in, in the more lethal cases. It was too long. The disease was in progress there. That's the first glimmer of hope, the first sort of fingertips on the cliff face here. If that antiviral works, that will change the whole thing because now the fear begins to go away. We never got a vaccine for HIV. It's treated with antivirals. So that's one option. Now, part B is chloroquine. We don't mention chloroquine anymore because Donald Trump has taken it. Oh, that might be a good thing because it turns out chloroquine is dangerous. Uh, last Friday, again, the big analysis shows it doesn't work for COVID-19 and it may cause heart problems. So we've gone off uh, part B. Part C is where I live. It's inflammation. You'll see the lungs there. They're becoming inflamed. The inflammatory macrophages go in. These things, the cytokines are listed there. We're now trying to block that inflammation and that's what I'm going to talk about in, in a minute in my own research. And then finally, part D is the antibody approach. You can use antibodies to kill the virus and anyone who's com convalescing can have antibodies in their blood. They're being tried and you can make monoclonals. That's a special type of antibody. So antibody therapies are another option. And now you get the idea where all these uh, sort of different approaches are being done in a sense and, and kind of the shots on goal idea. Any one has to work will make a difference here. Now, finally, and briefly in my own work, uh, next slide, please, Ali. We uh, discovered a molecule, uh, it's about three years ago now, I guess, called itaconite. And that had been discovered by two other labs as well. Remember, it's a very competitive business. We're up against it, trying to compete against labs around the world. Uh, and we're in competition now, at least two other labs on this. But this molecule, itaconite, is a profound anti-inflammatory molecule. It's made by your own body. And it's the off switch for inflammation. There are many off switches. This is one of them. And we had a paper in 2018 showing this molecule can suppress inflammation. 
in different contexts. And of course, now we're wondering, would it target SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19? And about two months ago now, uh, SARS experts contacted my lab and said, let's work on your molecule for COVID-19. And that was fantastic because now we had a great collaboration. And now we're working with labs in Holland and Belgium, testing our molecule against the virus uh, on the immune system as well to see if it can stop inflammation. And the next slide, Ali, gives you some of the reasons for this. There's the molecule, by the way, any chemist listening in, that's what it looks like. Uh, next slide, Ali. This is data that gives us hope. Now, we're only beginning, remember. We've no data. We, we got some data last week already that's a bit optimistic, but I don't want to talk about it because we're very cautious as scientists. We've got to keep repeating these things. In our paper, we stopped mice dying of sepsis with this molecule. Uh, the black line are mice dying of a thing called sepsis, which happens in gram-negative bacteria. We gave the mitochondria, and look, they live longer. And then, the, and then on the right-hand side, a, a rival lab nine months ago decided to try this against Zika virus. Now, Zika virus is a bit like SARS-CoV-2. It's in a similar kind of family. And look at this, the dotted line, the mice died. They gave the mice our molecule. We sent them our molecule. And look at this, the, the, the red line, a lot less death was happening. The black line, it got even better in a different protocol. So there's evidence this can stop mice dying of a virus that's similar to SARS-CoV-2. These two pieces of data gave me the idea that the taconite might work now against SARS-CoV-2, and that's exactly what we're testing. Very importantly, it's also anti-inflammatory. Anti and the reason why the mice aren't dying here is twofold. Uh, it's anti-inflammatory, stopping the inflammation and sepsis in the case of, on the left-hand side. But secondly, it, can, it seems to be antiviral. So you can imagine now my excitement. We could have two for the price of one in this molecule. It'll stop the lung inflammation and it'll also kill the virus. Now, very early days, we're just beginning. Uh, many experiments fail, and, and in my lab, and Kingston and Aideen would agree. We spend most of our time complaining to each other of experiments not working for whatever reason. But still, we're on the way now, and this center that we've now established is fantastic for us to explore this further. The last thing to say is we're taking samples that Aideen mentioned from the hospital, and we're measuring its aconite in the blood. We're also measuring inflammatory markers in the blood of these patients to see if we can get evidence from human, and that'll be brilliant. This last slide, I took it from the Zika paper. I didn't make this cartoon up in case you think I'm exaggerating. Uh, this is the Zika paper showing it's a cone. See that little, little spray thing killing Zika. Wouldn't it be marvelous if it kills SARS-CoV-2? And that's exactly what we're now pursuing in my lab as we speak. And again, great optimism. And finally, last slide. Remember, we're all in this together. If ever there was a case of putting many, many shoulders to the wheel, this is it. And I'm not just talking about the science. Keep washing your hands. Keep maintaining social distance. And for God's sake, wear a mask in public. Because if you don't, I'm going to come after you. So thanks very much for listening. Happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much for your insights and great presentations. So no surprises, there are lots of questions coming in from um, people who are listening in. So we'll start to um, go through some of those now. So. Um, Peter Lawless, um, we'll start with his question. So good afternoon, Peter. He starts off by congratulating you for the great work that's been done in Trinity. So thank you for that. And he's wondering about um, when you think that we will have testing capabilities to um, really start to um, um, have statistics and um, science behind some of the decisions that are being made. So what's your view on testing capabilities? I'll answer that one. So, so um, the Virus Reference Lab and UCD are, are starting a study very soon where they're going to test 5,000 individuals at two locations in Ireland to get an idea of the prevalence of the infection. Some people have estimated as low as 1%, but most of us think that's complete underestimate. We, we, we think it's more like between 5 and 15% of the population has been infected. Um, but to answer your question, really, when will it be rolled out? That's happening pretty much straight away. There are antibody tests that are commercially available, but we're actually developing our own antibody tests. Seamus Martin in the School of Genetics and Microbiology is very close to having a test ready, and he's working closely with, or will be when he has it ready, with Niall Condon, a clinical immunologist in St. James's, who will be doing these tests. So we hope to have our own testing for antibodies ready in a matter of weeks. Great, thanks Kingston. Luke or Aideen, would you like to add anything to that? Just also to say that we're working on a molecular test. I think Kingston mentioned it actually in the presentation, but one that will be 
much faster than the current PCR test that doesn't depend on the high tech equipment and can go out into the community and be a point of patient or point of, for example, used at an airport. So we're hoping to develop a test that will be much more rapid. I yeah, I mean, I might, I might add as well. I mean, testing is the key thing. We've been saying this for months, haven't we? You know, and, uh, and we keep saying there should be a minister for testing at cabinet level. If you get that wrong, this won't go away and things will get worse. The rapidity is the key thing. 18 points really important. To fly again, you'll be tested outside the airport and you'll be given the thumbs up. That has to be a rapid test, you see. So, so the focus on testing continues. And let, let's hope the, the antibody and antigen testing is the next one, by the way. That will be a really useful test if that comes up. That tests protein from the virus. It's much quicker than the PCR. So, so it's essential that Trinity participates in the testing business because it is going to be a hugely important part in the future. Great, thank you. We'll try and get through a few more questions. So Anna O'Loughlin and, and Brendan O'Brien have both have a question about immunosuppression and, and um, inflammation. So Anna's asking, is there a link between immunosuppression and pollution? And Brendan has asked, is there a downside or a risk to suppressing inflammation? I can go first. I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously your immune system is what keeps you alive here. It's, it's, your, it's your best friend to any infection. And remember, 99% of people fight this virus with their immune systems and get over it. So that's the important point to keep reminding people. Now the 1% is where we worry, they're the focus and we gotta make sure that 1% doesn't die. That's the, that's the whole mission here. Uh, things like pollution can damage the immune system but there wouldn't be a huge amount of evidence for that necessarily. Just keep your immune system healthy, the usual things. Take exercise, good diet, good night's sleep, you know, all the usual things. Try to stay happy to some extent because stress is a big negative and, we, and we've got a big interest in that in Trinity as well. Um, the immune of course you worry if you suppress the immune system, you might expose people to infection and people on immunosuppressants are at higher risk of infection. But in an emergency, which is what COVID-19 is, absolutely justified to suppress inflammation to keep the people alive. So that's why, that's why it's a useful thing to do. And just following on from that, um, Roseanne Kenny is joining us. So good afternoon, Roseanne. And she's wondering on any possible role of vitamin D deficiency and the severity of inflammatory response. I'll take that one. So vitamin D has been in the, in the limelight in, in terms of multiple sclerosis. In fact, there was a trial that I was peripherally involved with in St. Vincent's Hospital, Nile Tuberty and others were doing on treating patients with vitamin D as a sort of a very safe therapy for, for MS. And, and the basis of this is that um, vitamin D has anti-inflammatory properties. And, 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 and the evidence was actually strengthened by epidemiology studies for people living in colder climates were, get, were more susceptible to, to autoimmune diseases than those living in, in warmer climates. So vitamin D seems to have anti-inflammatory properties. But to be perfectly honest, I think that we need something a little bit more robust than this to treat, because it's such an acute disease. And coming back to the, the previous question that Luke answered, you know, suppressing the response, what we want to do, we want to do this very transiently. So it's only for a few days, really, where the real risks are. But you really have to go in there blunderbust. I don't think something as mild as vitamin D. Vitamin D works when you have a prolonged period of exposure to it. What do you do? Put everybody in vitamin D and hope that some of them will, will respond. I think we need something more strenuous like the anti-cytokine antibodies that Luke was talking about. I think these are a much better bet. There are a couple of questions coming in about um, the antibody assay. So uh, Brian Gartland is asking, can you tell the difference between a neutralizing and non-neutralizing antibody against SARS-CoV-2 in an antibody assay? And um, also in terms of the assay, Gabriela Herendez is asking, how accurate are those quick antibody tests? I'll take that one again, if I, if I may. The difference between a neutralizing antibody and a regular antibody is the neutralizing antibodies are the really important ones in terms of protecting you. And they're directed against the tip region of this protein called the spike protein, where it binds to its receptor. So if you stop the virus from binding to its receptor, it can't get into a cell. The virus needs to get into a mammalian cell to replicate. If it can't get into the cell, it can't replicate, so the virus infection is stopped in its tracks. So the neutralizing antibodies are key to protective immunity. So they're the important ones. Now, the ELISA antibodies, which we're all measuring in the labs, that are easier to measure, are sort of a surrogate of that. You know, normally when you have antibodies, a proportion of them are neutralized. So we're also developing neutralizing antibody assays, and that would be people like um, Andrew Bowie and, and Garrett Brady in, 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 in TBSI would be doing that. The second part of the question, I've forgotten. What was the second part of the question, Veronica, sorry? 
uh, about how accurate. Oh, how accurate. Okay, so the strip assays. Unfortunately, a lot of these assays, and most of them have come in from China, are of dubious quality. And the UK bought, I think, three and a half million um, uh, test kits and, and dumped them, having spent 100 million on them. Because when they evaluated them, they found they just weren't up to scratch. And that's my view on it. There are some that are probably all right. And, and um, you know, they may be very useful for GP surgery use, for example. But in terms of doing seroprevalence studies and accurate estimates of antibody, we need this ELISA type assay, the one that we're developing, the ones that are being rolled out by other companies. So the strip assays are useful in certain contexts, but they do have problems in terms of sensitivity and accuracy. So I wouldn't rely on them totally as a means of saying someone wasn't or was infected. I think also just to, to follow up with that, that Niall Conlon in St. James's is actually validating a lot of the tests yeah. that are on the market currently and will be able to discern, you know, the, the, the good tests and the bad tests as we also develop our own. There are a few questions coming in about immunity as well. So from Anna O'Loughlin, Alexandra Owens and Dara Brennan, they're um, all wondering around um, your views on herd immunity. Um, and are we all likely to contract the virus eventually? So your thoughts on that? I'll, I'll take that one as well, if I may, because I've been vocal in the media about herd immunity. There's a great really misconception about herd immunity. I've even heard very influential people um, saying that we're building up a level of herd immunity. Well, this is complete nonsense because you can't build up a level of herd immunity. You can build up a level of immunity, but not a level of herd immunity. Herd immunity is a threshold that you have to reach, a percentage of the population that's immune that then protects the whole population. And for most viruses, this is between 70 and 95% of the population. So there's no way we're anywhere near herd immunity with the current numbers of people that have been infected. If we had an effective vaccine and that vaccine was 100% effective and we gave it to 100% of people, we'd have a chance of getting herd immunity. What we have, so it's not herd immunity, but we have a population that's, that's immune because they've been infected. And they will be hopefully protected against reinfection, although we can't be sure of that. But all the indications based on previous um, viral infections are that if you have antibodies are protected. And um, all current antiviral vaccines work by generating antibodies. So that's how you, that they, they work. So it, it, having an antibody response is a good indication that you'll be protected. Great, thanks, Kingston. Um, so Col Colin Flynn um, is wondering, is there any data on how likely the virus is to mutate like influenza does? And if it does mutate easily, what will that mean um, in terms of um, um, suppression medication? I, I can have a go at that, Bonnegie, yes. So the good news is it doesn't mutate anywhere near the same rate as flu. Flu probably is four times the rate of mutation compared to COVID-2. It's got a very long genome, actually. It's a much longer amount of RNA. It's got its own proofreading mechanism, actually, to correct it as it replicates. So that's a good thing. Now, see, it's kind of a good thing and a bad thing, because it could have mutated to be less virulent. And the 1918 pandemic that people will be well aware of again, I suppose, is that became, that mutated become less virulent, you see. So, but, the, but on the other hand, it's not going to get any worse. And certainly it means that any vaccines, um, it, it may not be like flu, we have to have a new strain every season, you see. So that, that's, that's one of the good, the more positive aspects of this virus. Really. Donald uh, de Budler is um, joining us today as well. And he's talking about the reported death rates 15% uh, in the UK, he points out, 6.5% in Ireland, 1% in the Diamond Princess. And he's wondering, can we infer anything about these numbers, about the scale of infection in the population? I'll go first, Gigs. Well, I mean, first of all, I wouldn't trust any numbers at all. <laughs> That's the first thing. The, the number of people dying is a hard number. But it's, it's not, you know, it's a tricky one because there could be people dying of COVID-19 who aren't being registered as such. Other people are dying of it and being missed. Diagnosed. So it's a tricky one to get at, really, in terms of actually, well, we'll know eventually, of course, the uh, overall fatality rate. They reckon it is towards 1%, though, overall, which is much higher than flu, say. But, but I'd, I'd say those numbers are hard to judge, really. I'd, I'd say also, it's, it's much lower than, than, than people are predicting because we simply have not um, captured anything like the numbers of people that were infected. And, and really the, the, the important issue, and that's probably something that the authorities here didn't accept until maybe two or three weeks ago, 
that there was a huge issue with asymptomatic transmission. So nearly all the cases of infection in the nursing homes and the other health centers are around people bringing in the infection, not knowing they were infected. They had asymptomatic infections and they brought it in and then they gave it to people who, who developed symptoms. So, so asymptomatic carriage is a common feature of other infectious diseases and it's a serious feature of this infection. So around 50% of all cases are asymptomatic, which makes it very difficult to diagnose by symptoms. You have to really you know, test people by, by either PCR or, or afterwards antibody to know if they've been infected. It all comes back to testing again. Yeah, yeah. There, will, there, will be a, there will be a hard number in the end. And then we'll know exactly how many have died of this disease in different countries. And then we'll see what happened in the UK. And of course, we talk about Sweden as the other comparison, don't we? You know, but we can't tell at the moment. I think it's too early to say. And as Kingston said, I mean, the numbers are going to be widely from 0.1% of the population up to 2 or 3%, depending on who you're looking at. But because we don't know how widespread the virus has been, you can't calculate the death rate really at the moment. Okay, um, so we have time for a few more questions, I think. So, Nee Faulkner is wondering about the, the BCG vaccine. And um, she's wondering if those who've had the BCG vaccine have some protection. Is there any, any uh, data out there on that yet, Luke? Yeah, I mean, there are controversies about this, remember, and some immunologists don't think much of it. There, there's a dispute going on in the community, which is good because that's the way science should be. Um, um, but there is very good epidemiology that the BCG vaccine in Africa especially protects against measles and RSV. And, but this is in children. So if the vaccine won't give you 40 years protection, that's for sure. So if you had the BCG vaccine as a child and you're now my age, which I would have had the vaccine, that's, that's no good. So, so, and one reason why it might be protective is children who've been vaccinated aren't getting infected and aren't spreading it. So there might be a net decrease in that population. But I wouldn't trust any of the epidemiology. There's too many confounding variables. What we do know is it does protect against other diseases that are viral, that are respiratory. And now we wait for the trials as ever with most of this. There are, as I said, there's seven trials running. There's two big ones in Holland with Mihai, our collaborator, bigger in Australia, but we, we can't declare yet if it's going to work. But I'm, 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 I, Kingston's probably glass half empty on this one. I'm glass <laughs> half full, shall we say, you know, yes, and I'm waiting yes. to see what's going to happen to it, you see. So, and I do think if there is any efficacy at all there, it's a safe thing to give people. And it might be a bridge to the real vaccine. And, and that's the positive side of the argument. But I'm sure Kingston will have his view as well. No, no, Luke, you see, Luke works on innate immunity and, and BCG works by generating innate immunity. And I work on adaptive immunity. That's right. The immune response. So I'm more skeptical about the BCG data, to be honest. Um, yeah. I think, you know, I accept there may be a beneficial in the short term, but really, if we want to beat this virus, we need to generate adaptive immunity. And the way you do that is with a vaccine, a proper vaccine. When I say a proper vaccine, I mean one that's based around SARS. And Luke mentioned this earlier. It's unbelievable what's going on in the vaccine front. There are 100 plus clinical trials. There are 100 plus candidate vaccines. But eight of these are in phase one trials. Two of them are already going into phase two within three months. It is absolutely phenomenal the pace that it's, that's happened. So if you want to take something positive from this, it's the vaccine. So what, is, what has happened in the last literally few days is some of the early data from the Moderna trial and from a trial in, the, in, in, in China. And the Chinese uh, scientists are doing a great job. They've been criticized for lots of things, but they're actually doing a good job here. And the data looks very positive from the vaccine front, getting these neutralizing antibodies generated with the candidate vaccines, showing data in animal models that it works. So I have to say, I'm much more positive about a vaccine working now than I was a month ago. So that's the positive, I think, uh, that, that we're looking towards. Has there been any work, Luke, done in countries where the BCG vaccine wasn't a public health measure and comparing these countries to, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's part of the evidence, in a way, that, that compared countries where there's no vaccines versus where there is. And there does seem to be less lethality in the ones that have vaccinated. But, of but the course trouble is that, but that, that population could be older. But there could be other reasons for that, you know, so you can't really say that. And it's older people who are dying, remember, exactly. and they wouldn't have had a vaccine in decades. Yeah. So you're stumbling around for a mechanism there. But I, I do think if you look at the, the, many countries vaccinate with BCG still aggressively. India does. Africa does. And, and you get a great response and, and this innate barrier goes up. So there could be a transient protection there is the idea. Yeah. The other thing on BCG, which is a bit bizarre and people might or might not know this, it's a first line treatment for bladder cancer. So giving um, 
Live BCG up into the bladder is actually a very effective treatment for bladder cancer. So what it does there is to non-specifically stimulate the immune response, which has this great, great immune stimulating activity. So that may be the basis of how it's working against the short term thing. So it's, it's, it's short term in terms of the nature response is early in the infection. And if you, if you can sort of control it early, you may, the disease may not be as severe. So yeah. It may have some benefits. Yeah. I, I predict if, if there is a signal in the trials, they'll vaccinate the older people in the nursing homes, again, give them a boost, and maybe the healthcare workers. It gives an extra barrier to that population, and then that will decrease, you know, lethality, I guess is the word we use for this. So that, that's the optimistic part. It's unlikely that everybody's going to get a BCG vaccine. That seems unlikely. And as Kingston said, it gives us a bit of time then to, until the real vaccine comes, which we desperately need, because the real vaccine will give what's called sterilizing immunity. That's the goal of all this. So Michelle O'Reilly and Peter Kelly have both um, thanked you for the presentation and, and uh, commented how, how great they thought it was. So what they're asking is, um, is there any data on percentage of COVID-19 patients who are taking in immunosuppressive medicines? And related to that, Peter's asking about the likely effect of um, TNF-alpha medication on the course of the infection in an individual. I haven't, that's a good question, I haven't seen it. I mean, there will be a certain number of people who have rheumatoid arthritis or on an immunosuppressant who would have got infected, I'd say. Probably, you know, older population, these kinds of diseases are more common. So you'd like to know that, I mean, anybody on an immunosuppressant who might be listening in, remember, we've known that if you're on an immunosuppressant for say rheumatoid or lupus, you have a slightly higher risk of getting a viral infection. So you've got to mind yourself. It's not a massively increased risk. You shouldn't worry about it. But you should think, oh, maybe I'm a slightly vulnerable group here. I might be a slightly higher risk. And then when you get infected, you know, your immune system will hopefully do a bit of its work, I suppose, and help. Even though the immunosuppression is there, there's still a bit of immune activity. Because you're not getting sick most of the time, remember. So these, immune, these immunosuppressants aren't so dramatic as to make you sicker from regular infection. So, so it's, not, it's not a major concern at all. I mean, I know in, in Trinity, there's a group, um, um, Jean Fletcher, who works on autoimmune disease with some of the consultants in, in St. Vincent's, are doing a study right now looking at some of the patients, multiple cirrhosis and RA patients that are on immunosuppressive therapies. But there's also some data emerging. This cytokine called IL-17 may be um, one of the pathogenic cytokines. And there's a drug that blocks IL-17, which has been in sakinumab which is a very effective uh, treatment for psoriasis, which people now have suggested might be the next one to be tried in COVID-19. So there are a lot of weapons in the arsenal potentially there that we could, we, we could look at. And I think also there's a group in James is led by Mark Little, who's going to look at this as part of this project actually. Yeah. Um, and I mean, there are different opinions on this because some will say that, you know, if you're on immunosuppressive therapy, that may actually benefit you if you if you were susceptible to a cytokine storm, and then others will say, well, actually, you need that heightened immune response to um, actually clear the virus. So the jury is out, and there are different camps, and we actually need to do the experiments on this. I think. So I think we have time for just one last question. So. Um, do you have a time estimate on the molecular testing capability? Um, the molecular testing capabilities, are, it's more difficult to put a timeline on. I think I can put a timeline on the antibody ones has been, you know, you know, within weeks. Although, in fact, the ones that are commercially available are already been rolled out. Um, um, a company called Abbott have a platform that's available here. It's not hugely high throughput. They can do 200 tests in an hour, which isn't too bad. But we really need to talk about thousands per hour. So th those are going to be possible in the, in the future weeks. The, the, if, if, he's ref if that question is referring to the, to the assays for the virus, of course, there already is an assay for the virus. What we need are more um, um, you know, high throughput ones. And th there, there's a group in James's working on a more high throughput ones, which could take a couple of months. Great, thank you. I think we're going to have to leave it there. There are other questions and we'll do our very best to get back to the people who've posted the questions over the course of the hour. So it just remains me for me to thank Aideen, Luke and Kingston for sharing your expertise with everybody this afternoon. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody who's here and listening that we wish you the very best with your endeavours in this really important research project. And congratulations for getting it up and running and um, best, best of luck really in, in, in the months and years ahead on this. 
So um, thank you everybody for um, engaging in the conversation today and for posting your questions. And with that, I'm going to pass back over to Susanna. Thanks so much, Veronica. Um, really, again, uh, there, there's so much that you, you've shared with the audience today. There's so many more questions that have come in that we didn't have time to answer, uh, but uh, it's, it's great to, to know that you've been able to share uh, over the last 45 minutes or so today. We really appreciate your time. Um, I wanted to thank also all of you, our attendees, again, for being with us today. There were about 400 people listening in and watching in, so a really important topic. Uh, for, for discussion today. Um, and also thank you to all of our uh, team in the background who helps to make these webinars happen, in particular to Ali Hartney and Anna O'Loughlin. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, this webinar or any of the others that we run, uh, please email us at alumni at tcd.ie. If you have more questions about the Trinity COVID-19 Immunology Project, the URL is there on the bottom of your screen. Um, if you go to the tcd.ie website and click on campaign, you can find more information about the project there. Next week, Inspiring Ideas is welcoming Professors Oren Doyle and Ariana Vidashi, and they will be speaking about the legal responses to COVID-19, personal freedom in a time of emergency. That's uh, Wednesday, June 3rd at 4 p.m. We really hope to welcome you again next week. And in the meantime, please stay safe. Thank you.